It's Friday, Feedback Friday, the feedback day of the week. Huh. It's Feedback Friday. Thank God it's Friday. I am so tired. Uh, <laughs> enough on that. Part of it is I, I smashed up my uh, right arm pretty badly, moving some furniture, getting prepared to start shooting boss fight. Um, you can't see it much here. You can see a lump on my arm, right? You can't see the bruise because it's like, 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 blended into the freckles but you you can see where my arm should go straight and it goes like burp. there's a notable bump like right here so the patrons got tons of updates on me smashing up my arm and on one link my kitty decided to be super cute because of course his name's link he has to be like super cute but also very brave so help support this channel become a monthly patron patreon.com slash k if you want to see even more uh, embarrassing details of how I love to smash myself up, plus cats. Uh, and more in-depth boss fight updates happen there. Uh, I know I'm way overdue on a Kickstarter update. I will do one by the beginning of March, I swear to God. Um, it, there's just like this weird... By the time I get through everything else I intend to do in a given day, that to do post-Kickstarter update, I don't know why. It's like a weird mental block or something. Um, but yeah... Uh, moving on to the feedback for this week. Um, I'm going to try to touch on the Bernie Bros video, something very, very simple. Because um, I think that went pretty well, all things considered. Um, that was one of those ones where I was prepared for some blowback on it. But even people who self-identified as Bernie Bros were cool about what I said. Um, and it's interesting because the people, quite a few people, I won't, paint everybody with the same thing but some people said they identify as a bernie bro because a segment of the population um uses bernie bro as a pejorative against any male bernie sanders supporter not the way i did and so they've sort of adopted it as a screw you you're not going to mind control me kind of thing some people feel an affinity with um uh, shitlords and deplorables as some commenters pointed out and like that's cool like if you're not going to reject what I'm saying because you identify with a label that's awesome right like I don't immediately reject people just because I self-identify as a feminist and some people think feminism's bad so that's awesome um the the reasons were kind of interesting, and this is... I learn a lot talking to people with views different from my own. Um, I... And maybe this is like a Canadian politics and American politics thing, and, and how our, our different political systems work. I'm not sure. I'm just guessing in this regard. But, like, because our system... You know, if, if a party has a majority government, they pretty much have the votes to do anything they want. So we, I guess, have a higher threshold of politicians keeping their promises. Whereas it seems like, because this has come up a lot talking to American voters. A lot of American voters don't believe that um, the person they're supporting is actually going to be able to get done what they're promising and this is this is strange from a canadian point of view and it, it only kind of clicked in with me this week that it's like oh maybe this is a different perspective i don't know um i'm gonna suggest a theory that it is that america some americans have different expectations for their politicians they kind of want to um vote for somebody where even if they get 30 to 50 percent done of of what they're promising that's good they're actually in some cases willing to vote for somebody who is more radical than they're comfortable for on the assumption that they won't do what they claim they're going to do now that happened in the 1990s in ontario with a politician named mike harris and Mike Harris ran openly on cuts to public services um, and a bunch of other stuff that people kind of assumed, oh, he's not. He's just saying that to get elected. He's not going to do most of that. And then he did. 
and it trashed my old neighborhood, significantly increased the gang problem that Toronto has and and did a lot of a lot of things bad things to the education system and uh, the healthcare system and all that stuff that we are still trying to sort out to this very day. And so maybe that's why I'm I'm very hesitant to go, oh, I don't I don't expect nor do I want a politician to do everything they've promised because then how do I know what I'm supporting? Like if I like this bucket of policies from a politician, but not this bucket of policies from a politician, how do I know which bucket is going to get done? Like it's possible that they'll do all the things I didn't like and none of the things I did. And like I said, this may just be a Canadian perspective as opposed to an American one. I'm not sure. But I did find that interesting. And see, this is what happens um, when you listen to people with ideas different from your own and, and don't freak out. Now, other people did point out that he has some pretty radical people working for him. There was an article in the Daily Beast that I did not share because I don't consider the Daily Beast a terribly reliable source. Um, but in this case, it it sort of checks out. I just, like I said, I have a policy on that stuff. But there was a guy who, after this article came to light, the Sanders campaign fired him. But he basically had a troll account on Twitter and was saying horrible things about people to judge his sexuality. This person who got fired is, is gay himself, I should be clear. Um, but that horribly nasty things about Amy Klobuchar's appearance. Some things about Elizabeth Warren, but the vitriol at Klobuchar is just... And he was recently promoted. The article came out. The guy was fired. Bernie Sanders also has Linda Sarsour as a surrogate. And that woman has posted some really hateful stuff um, about Jews. Not about... Israel, she uses this coded word Zionists. Zionists equals Jews, not the state of Israel, not the government of Israel. Zionists. She actually uses the term Zionists. There is a a well a, a forgery that is is the basis for a lot of anti-Semitism called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So when somebody calls Jews a Zionist. That's a big code word. He still he still associates with her. Like this is one of the former heads of the Women's March, you know, the organization that was accused of anti-Semitism. And Bernie Sanders being Jewish himself, of Jewish heritage himself, is not a shield to that. If you've got bigots working for you, that matters. And you know, I'm not saying he's he's terrible. Um this is about how people debate issues. And I think it's more important that we listen to each other and try to understand where each other's coming from instead of agreeing. And I think that this, you know, piece of, um, extra piece of learning um, with, um, with people who self-identify as Bernie bros because they believe it's a pejorative and, and so on. That, that was interesting to me. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, the other interesting thing is some people said that Bernie Sanders is, he's a, an economic leftist instead of a cultural leftist. Therefore, and I, that, that opinion, I admit, took me aback because, you know, just the stuff I've seen as a, as a, you know, I have MSNBC on in the background a lot because I got sick of CNN and all the crosstalk and the stupid baiting. Um, but, you know, I hear over, Donald Trump is a racist and a sexist and a homophobe. And of course, he, he doesn't cite specific instances of racism, sexism, and homophobia. He just throws that label at Trump. I mean, that, that's, that's name calling, right? I mean, I'm no Trump fan. Under no circumstances, I'm a Trump fan. But I admit, I my hackles go up when it's he's a racist and a sexist and a homophobe because, first of all, that just divides people. Second of all, um, 
I think it's more productive to say why, but it's not. He's just the worst president in history and he must be defeated. He is an existential threat, you know, and I, I admit that to me is the worst kind of identity politics um, because it just divides people. So I was really surprised at another perspective that he's actually less of a problem than other people still running in the Democratic Party. And quite frankly, I can't think of anybody who's more on the identitarian left than Bernie Sanders. But, you know, like I said, I'm not American. So this difference in perspective is very interesting. Either way, again... I do not consider all Sanders supporters Bernie bros. Um, I consider people who, and, and to me, Bernie bro is a gender neutral term. If there's a female Bernie Sanders supporter who acts mean online, who, who can't keep it in bounds, who gets personal and nasty and he's a racist and a sexist and a whole, you know, m imitates that language. She can be a Bernie bro. Like Bernie bro, it's just the BB, right? The alliteration. It's it's not, it's not, to me, a gendered term. I know that that may sound weird, but that's just the way I think about it in my head. There are female Bernie bros. Because um, I thought like, you know, cool story bro kind of thing, that, that really aggressive, like, go team thing. That's what I associated with Bernie bro. Um... But, uh, yeah, I, I, overall, I thought the conversation surrounding that was really good. Um, I did promise a guy I would, um, talk about something that he, he wrote me this very passionate Twitter DM and he persuaded me that this was significant about to talk about, not because he didn't get angry. He didn't attack me. Like that was all good, but not only did he care a lot, which is important, he also made some really valid points. And if you want to persuade me to talk about something, make valid points. Um, he talked about the fact that, you know, when, when you're talking about any given issue, this was, you know, politics and gaming, but it applies to anything. There are some people who are legitimately bad actors and it's important not to lose sight of that. And people who will abuse... Um, you know, will will abuse any good idea because basically these are my words, not his. They're narcissist authoritarians, and they will they will manipulate any system. And so, I just want to be clear. Um, when I talked about the people who said, "I don't want politics and gaming," I'm not talking about the people who use that as a code for saying, I don't want politics and gaming that doesn't agree with mine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the people that I talked to that I knew were sort of left of center who agreed with a lot of the, you know, don't be racist, don't be sexist, that stuff. They agreed with that in principle, but they didn't want to constantly have to think about it, especially when they're playing video games. It's not that these people are especially conservative. The reason I found it so compelling, so interesting, that people who lean to the left were like, I don't want, and like I said, it's I don't want partisanship in gaming stuff. A lot of people said, confirmed, that when they say, I don't want politics in gaming, what they really meant was the not, not using political themes in their games. That, that's fine. It was the, if you don't agree with me, you're the bad, you're a bad person style of politics. And it's almost like we need another word for it, for clarity. But I think no matter what the word is, somebody will say, that means you're bad. And that's just saying the same thing. So, you know, um, I, I promised the guy I would, I would talk about, I would acknowledge the presence of some legitimate bad actors on both sides of the politics and gaming equation. There are operatives who are trying to torque people towards their political perspective, either by propaganda or by sheer intimidation. Um, that's real. Um, that Those are not people that persuade me to change my mind. Um, 
I, <laughs> I get into a lot of trouble because I would rather make an enemy than be bullied. And it's got it, it's gotten into me me into a lot of trouble career wise that I won't bend the knee just because it's either exper expedient or because I'm intimidated. Um, and and a lot of prior life experience informs that. Um, and like I said, it's not necessarily the most noble trait. Some people would say, oh, it's, it's, uh, that's a good thing. It's like, no, that's the reason why Ned Stark got killed at, spoiler, the end of the first season of Game of Thrones. Um, I totally understand why some people are, um, they just keep their head down and they do things out of expediency. Um, I don't. <laughs> and, and part of that is that this is what checking your privilege is supposed to look like. I was fundamentally affected growing up where I did, which is a neighborhood in uh, the, the northwest area of Toronto called the Jane Finch area. It's predominantly non-white, very large um, Afro-Caribbean population, meaning black people. Um, a, a lot of, like, a lot of everything, a lot of Asian people, a lot of South Asian people, um, you know, but then there's sort of those, uh, Italian neighborhoods left over as well. Like there's a, uh, there's Muslim, tons of Muslim immigrants. Um, then you got like the, the Somali people who, who are like Muslim and black. Um, so like there's Muslim Middle Eastern and then there's Muslim black, black people and, and all that stuff. So it was, it was a really cool melting pot. Mix, uh, I shouldn't say, it was a mosaic. It was a mosaic. It wasn't a melting pot. Everybody kept, their, everybody kept their culture. And there were tensions to an extent. People didn't want to say the wrong thing. People didn't want to unnecessarily offend the, the uh, you know, the overlay of poverty impacted things. But that gave me a firsthand look of how systemic bias does exist and how, you know, I saw... Um, the the black and brown kids I went to school with being treated notably differently by not the teachers so much. We had great teachers, um, even though most of them were white. They, they did not treat black and brown kids any differently than anyone else. Um, I had one teacher who, a, a chemistry teacher, who really, really resented the Asian kids who... Uh, went to summer school to get a better grade and then came back and took the uh, the the senior level, what we called OAC at the time, chemistry course to actually learn stuff. He was brutal on those kids because he thought it was gaming the system, but that was more their actions than their race, right? Um, but as soon as we stepped out of the school, bus drivers, like, like transit, TTC, what we call the Toronto Transit Commission, the, the city bus, they treated black kids differently. Black kids were mo more likely to get accused of trying to try to fair skip. Um, business owners, people at just like local variety stores and restaurants treated black and brown kids like default criminals. And you saw this again and again and again and again, not in the schools, in the community around the schools. And you saw, because these people were my friends, right? So I was there with, the seeing these interactions where I would walk by no problem and they get stopped. And it wasn't just because I went on first. Cause it was like, Oh, you get on first and they got stopped. And it wasn't always the same black kid. It was always just singled out for being black. Like I've been in situations where I watched, you know, I was, I was at a, a radio shack type store. Um, they call them the source up here now, but I, I watched one of the salesmen follow, my friend's kid around the store. Um, he was black. And I, um, you know, the minute I went up and talked to him, the guy backed off. All of a sudden, the guy had like the stamp of white approval. Therefore, oh, he was less likely to shoplift now. And I see this stuff. And my friend said to me, don't tell him he doesn't see it and I don't want him to. 
And I was like, that's that's very strong. As uh, granted, that's something you can do in Canada. Um, but, you know, I've seen it. I've I, black women, brown women get treated like they're stupid and they have really good ideas. I saw when I worked in music, you know, I saw hip hop acts come through and I, I, I did a, a an award winning documentary on on hip hop music. And, uh, you know, I had a hard go because a bunch of the um, the acts that I approached to be interviewed on it, they're like, you know what? Your channel's more than happy to talk to us about being black. But when it comes to playing our music, suddenly you don't pick up the phone. Back when people picked up the phone, this before texting. Um, and I said to them, you know what? You're right. And I don't have a ton of control over that. But I will, in the show I program, try to get your video in uh, when I can. And I did. I, I, you know, it was maybe only two or three videos, but at least I kept my word, right? That's real, you know? Um, and these are among people who claim to be like, you know, great liberals. It's, it's real. It's true. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the current prescriptions are going to help anything. Somebody posted... A really good article, it's a Medium post, written by a guy named um, Musa Al-Jarbi. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link in, in the box. And it's called On the Relationship Between Ideological and Demographic Diversity. And it talks about why black and brown kids and poor whites, who are the first in their family to go to college in the U.S., feel so out of place. And basically the short version is that white liberals who control academia want more visual diversity, meaning they want more black and brown people because so they can point to them and go, look, black and brown people. But black and brown people that come from the lower echelons of, of the economic brackets tend to lean more conservative socially. And so these kids show up and they're, they're treated as some sort of prize pony and still they, until they start expressing their views and then it's wrong thing. And this is one of the things I saw firsthand in, in schools, um, in higher thought. Um, it's a real thing. And that's lip service diversity. That's not real diversity. There's reasons that people in certain communities lean more conservative in their thinking. And being conservative doesn't mean you're wrong. It, it's the path to that conservatism that matters, right? And, and how strident they are about everybody having to think the same way they are. And that's the problem with leftist academia, right? They need everybody to think the same way they do. And this brings me to the last topic. This video is going to be longer than I wanted, but I wanted to get this all in. Um, the number one topic of comment in the video about um, cliques in video game communities, when I, when I dealt with the roots of misogyny, and one person said, is, is there any actual science to this or is this all bullshit? No, there's, there's science to this. Um, the idea that it's rooted in fear. People who are legitimate misogynists is rooted in, in bad early life experiences and fear. Um, and one person said, misogyny means hate, not fear, and got very upset about it because they didn't like the idea of implied intents. And it's like, look, this is the explanation for, whoop, for why some people act like hateful jerks, okay? This is not, I'm going to claim you're a misogynist with no behavior from you. Let me try to explain it to you this way. Somebody who has a phobia of spiders, right? They're terrified of spiders. They'll go, I hate spiders. But the underlying thing is fear. And that's one of the things we have to... Anger is not always a masking emotion. Hatred is very unhealthy. There's a big difference between healthy anger and hatred. Uh, healthy anger can kind of motivate you. Hatred just brings everybody down. And as a couple people said, hatred is taught. Hatred is learned. I absolutely agree with that. But what makes someone glomp onto that particular kind of hatred is rooted into early life trauma. 
And the biggest bucket of comments that I saw, and no, like Chaos Buddy, I didn't find your comment misogynist. I went and looked for it. No, you didn't. You're good. Um, like Chaos basically asked if he's misogynist because he's had problems with basically a group of women in the past who he found didn't keep their promises. And, you know, he said he noticed the woman he knew were less likely to keep their promises than than the men. And to me, that's not judging somebody because they're women. That's judging people because they don't keep their promises. And just because they happen to be women, no, you're you're focusing on on behavior that is not subjective. You know, whether or not somebody kept their promises is pretty cut and dried. Um so that's just bad luck and a mark of misogyny is can be a guy or or a woman who will always keep their promises to a man but feels more uh licensed to break them with women now people are like what about misandry can these same like fears rooted in early life register as misandry because of bad experiences with male parents and and yes absolutely and this is where we get into the jungle of terms there are some people unwilling to accept that misandry exists at all because they think that the only type of any sort of bigotry is systemic bigotry um You'll hear the same explanation for, oh, black people can't be racist because we were oppressed by colon by colonialism or, you know, so on and so forth. That it's that, you know, um, racism is prejudice plus power. I don't subscribe to that theory. I, I definitely think systemic racism is a huge problem that needs to be addressed, but that doesn't mean it's the only form of racism. You know, um, if you've got a neighbor who's horribly racist, they don't have any systemic power over your, your land over their land, you, their, their land over. You are equal in society, but dealing with that racist neighbor or sexist neighbor or homophobic neighbor and so on and so forth is exhausting. And... Um, that's true of misandry as well. Misandry is a real thing because women are people. And so women are just as capable of men as being damaged in early life, meaning they can develop, um, they can develop fear-based hatreds or a fear-based distrust of men just the same way they can develop a fear-based distrust of women. And it's a real thing. It can cause mothers to horribly abuse their male children. It is an absolute real thing. And it doesn't do us any good to pretend like it doesn't exist just because it's not. When we talk about systemic sexism, systemic misogyny, what we basically mean is stuff like men were never denied the right to, for instance, vote because they were men. They may have been denied it because of their race. You know, they may have been denied it because of their nationality or economic status, but not because they were men. And there was a time where women of the same economic class as their brothers, husbands, and fathers could not vote. That's what we talk about. We talk about systemic misogyny. But misandry on the social level, on the individual level, is absolutely possible and absolutely real. And anybody who will not acknowledge this is not... I, I, I think that's... Either they've had their head full of junk or they're just arguing in bad faith. Um, and that brings me to something else I realized oh yeah I should mention this and now I'm I'm uh, blo oh I remember what it was finally to close um the comments I made about trans women I know those were going to be controversial but some people said well isn't the goal then to treat for these these straight white cis het dudes to treat women 
and trans men the way we treat trans women. And I, I thought it was interesting that nobody, nobody I saw, you know, there were a lot of comments on that video and I only read the first like 60, but nobody I saw argued with me that, yeah, there aren't the same number of trans men as trans women writing and, and high profile talking about games. And some people said that's just because they're not interested. Well, that's what? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, no, there there has been, you know, your your gender identity does not dictate your interests. Um, but, you know, this idea of shouldn't we be treating cisgendered women the way we treat transgender women, which is basically like guys. And I get why people think that, and I get why this is a difficult, to ex difficult thing to explain. But not treating a trans woman like a quote-unquote real woman. No, that's not good. You know, if these guys have problems with women, but don't see trans women as real women, no, that's not a good thing just because they treat them like they're men. Because trans women are not men. And that trans woman, over time, is going to notice that they're treated differently. And if, if you want to... Tra trans women are uniquely... Sensitive is the wrong word, but uniquely aware and challenged by their gender identity issues because trans women have this unique thing that goes on where as they start feeling more and more like themselves, which is a good thing, their, 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 their you know, um, view of themselves finally matches what they see in the mirror more and more. Maybe not, you know, quite. It's a process, but more and more it gets better. The, the way society in general treats them changes and makes them feel not very good. You know, there, there have been tons and tons and tons of things written about how trans women feel like their ideas are less um, less respected, that they're interrupted more, that all this stuff. So they're getting that, you know, loss of status, loss of privilege associated with feminization. And I'm not saying this, they're saying this, okay? Well, they're starting to feel more and more like themselves. Now, you're that person, you're deeply sensitive about this. And you notice that your editor or your manager is starting to treat you less than a man, but not as less as your cisgender female colleagues. That is not better. That's double fucking with your head because it's the awareness of, holy shit, this dude's a misogynist and I ever, I didn't notice this when I, people saw me as male. Or maybe they did and, and they didn't realize the depths of it. But then it's, yeah, this dude's a misogynist. But I'm getting special, special privileges because he doesn't see me as female. That hurts. That I'm not a real woman. It, it just, if you haven't, and I, I can't. I, I can interpret here, I am sharing here, but I cannot do it with the power and the passion of somebody's uh, who's had this as their lived experience. You don't feel better because you're getting privileged minority treatment or you're not like those other blank treatment. It is central to a trans person's identity that they be not their identity, their their sense of self, their sense of belonging, their feeling like they are accepted by the people around them, that they are accepted as a woman or as a man. That's very important. And if they have to spend every day at work going, oh, wow, I get, I get to write about this stuff, but that's because I'm not really a woman, that will wear someone down. That will cause them major workplace stress in the, in the long run. Like, Think about it. Doesn't matter what it is. Imagine, you know, you're you're getting short term special privileges because you're not really equal. You're not really real, right? It's the same way that benevolent sexism against women works, right? 
that, oh, it may seem that women get an easier ride or special privileges in the short term. But when it comes down to respecting someone as a leader or really, you know, really seeing someone as an equal, when it really counts, when you have to be somebody's boss, when you have to be somebody's, you know, supervisor, leader, even when you're dealing with people in a professional sense, you know, you are hired to do skilled work and you have to deal with something that, oh, no woman really likes computers. No woman's really good at computers, this kind of stuff, right? It just angers you. I mean... A lot of people who deal with computers are seen as, you know, less intelligent or, or less promotable because they may, may be profoundly introverted or on the autism spectrum. And they're crazy smart, but they, they just don't communicate the way, uh, you know, people who aren't on the spectrum do. And so they're seen as less than. And that's a constant source of frustration and pain and stress. So while it may seem like there's short-term benefits to trans women, no, it isn't, not in the long term. And that's, I was very careful to talk about it in those terms. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because there's a real, unfortunately, there's some real transphobia that happens in turf groups, trans-exclusive, you know, radical or reactionary feminists groups where some feminists do not accept trans women as real women. I'm not one of them. Trans women are women, period, end of story. You know, um, there is no difference to me. I cannot for the life of me, and I intellectually know it's a thing, but I cannot for the life of me understand why someone who is attracted to women would be attracted to a trans woman until they find out they're trans. And I understand this happens all the time. I just don't get it. I do not understand why that is an issue. But that is an issue for a lot of people. I'm saying that this way. Um, that's not okay. Like, and that's why I said it. Like, this may seem like an advantage to trans women in games journalism. It's not. Because they're being, one, they're still being used as token. And they're being used as a token in a uniquely profound transmisogynistic way. And this is why when we do the oppression Olympics, when we, when we think of, um, you know, uh, uh, oppression or bigotry or, or, or prejudice as this, like, this mountain and some people are down here and some people, instead of thinking it like a web and you know normative whatever being at the center and then everybody else getting pushed more and more to the sides this is where we get into problems because if you use like the wheel method um which was always the chart i saw when we were dealing with marginalization is which is what we called it back in the 90s instead of systems of oppression it was marginalization that there were people who were part of the mainstream that middle that middle of of the wheel right that middle of the graph the web and everybody else was pushed to the side in one way or another. And the metaphor I was, I was told is if you can drive down the middle of the road, you can stay on the road pretty easy. The closer and closer to the edge you have to drive, the harder it is to stay on the road. Especially when you got a car that like back then cars had a pull to the left or the right way more than they do now. So it was common to drive a car that pulled to the left or pulled to the right. So that was the metaphor. Um, now we have this oppression terminology that I, I don't, I don't think is as helpful because when you, you think about it like that, right? Like some people are right in the center, so they are less likely to be pushed off the edge. It doesn't mean that everybody else doesn't have a spot, at least temporarily, but their position is more precarious. That's more accurate to what's really going on. And, you know, a, a few people said that their issue is not so much that somebody has their views. It's that they don't seem honest about it, you know. Um, and and I, I thought about this and it's like, do I really care if somebody is an open misogynist or not? And then I realized, you know what? Yeah, they're right. Because, and I've had, I've had, Friends tell me this about race, like they'd rather somebody be an open racist. And I finally kind of get it because 
if someone's an open misogynist, you're just like, they're a misogynist. And you can point to it, you can document it, and there's no argument. When someone is in denial, hiding it consciously or unconsciously, there's always this, oh, he didn't mean to. He didn't mean it like that. You just took it the wrong way. You're too sensitive. And then you end up being gaslighted constantly when you're at work. Whenever you try to go, I have an issue with this. And I'm using misogyny at this example. This is true of anything else, right? Um, systems of, of power, systems of margin, marginalization can change from environment to environment, right? Um, you know, if you're the one Chinese guy at a predominantly black company, you might get treated differently. And I just pulled those because I don't want to be, I, I don't want it to be the white and everybody else thing. Um, you know, if you're an indigenous person at a company owned by South Asians, you might get treated differently, right? Um, there, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a situation right now where somebody got this really awesome job with flex time, but because there's the work from home option, they get no, they get no sick days. And I said, what about this person's Jewish and the company's not? I said, what about? Jewish holidays would that be docked pay or is that in a different bucket and they didn't have an answer like it's stuff like this and and the only way we solve these problems is to stop trying to look for a chart to do our thinking for us and to actually start looking at it and going every single person has to constantly be on themselves Am I treating this person differently because of immutable characteristics am I judging their behavior differently because something about them that they can't change rubs me the wrong way or would this bug me no matter who did it that matters and there's no shortcut to everybody constantly making sure they're not treating people differently for stuff they can't control there's there's no way around it and I I consider myself kind of fortunate that I don't <sighs> It's much easier for me, somebody who is totally comfortable, who is always totally comfortable on gay people, always totally comfortable on trans people, you know? Um, and I wasn't raised that way. It just, for whatever reason, the the stuff didn't take with me. I was just like, people are people. You're not, you're not that different from me. Maybe it's because I have a self-identity as a weirdo, so I just don't care. But... That's not the same as being aware of somebody else's sensitivities and recognizing that there's certain things you have to be sensitive to with people who are different. Um, but somebody who is legit, they don't understand these issues, they're not comfortable with these issues, they may have had a bad experience when they were younger, it's so much harder for them to change their views than someone like me who started from a much easier place in that regard. And there's got to be a way, and the current system does not reward change because people just take something you said 10 years ago and continue to hold it against you and don't judge you for the person you are now and, and all the steps you've taken to, to improve, to become more worldly, to change your mind. And this came up on Twitch yesterday, the idea that there's got to be carrots as well as sticks. And that's my question, 45 minutes in if you're still watching, what are the carrots? What would you guys who have had to change your points of view on things, what would make you feel like the efforts were seen and heard and acknowledged? Not rewarded, that's not the way it works, but just... What would make you realize people are judging you for who you are now instead of some shitty views you may have had held 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago? Let me know. I'm very interested in that for the people still watching. And you know what's coming now? The last of the week. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Anna Thanks for watching.